Good morning, bonjour. Okay, there's nothing in this talk about category theory. Um, we're not talking about type level programming or type classes, even though frameless makes heavy use of both. This talk is listed as an introductory talk or a beginner's talk, um, and it more or less is. Um, instead, what we're going to focus on is kind of a gentle introduction to Apache Spark, but with a slightly different focus than some. Okay, so I'm going to try to compare and contrast three. Um, two popular-ish APIs and one becoming popular for interacting with Spark. Okay, so we're going to look at the Data Frames API, the Data Sets API, both of which are available in Scala, and then compare that a little bit with the Frameless API. And I'm going to try to show you the pro some of the pluses and minuses of each one. Um, obviously, it's going to be a little bit biased toward Frameless. I am not an expert in Frameless. Like many people, I'm playing with it and enjoying it. Um, I may well make a couple of mistakes, which you're welcome to point out to me. Uh, we're going to do, uh, again, this is oriented primarily toward learning how to use these APIs. If you're not new to Spark, some of this may bore you. Hopefully it won't. If you are new to Spark, hopefully it won't go over your head. Um, and I'm hoping that at the end, you'll walk away at least with a little bit of understanding of Spark if you don't understand it already. And you'll have some idea of how Frameless compares to the two native APIs in Spark. Okay, and I will not be talking about RDDs at all. If you're using them, you are probably still writing an assembler, and I would recommend that you don't do either one these days. Um, and it's not a slide-oriented uh, talk. I'm actually going to be spending most of my time inside a notebook environment. It happens to be the Databricks notebook environment. Uh, I work for Databricks, so I have to use their environment. So if you're used to Jupyter or Zeppelin, I'm sorry, you're going to be using ours. Um, the source to all of these, um, uh, the notebooks and even the slides are in this GitHub repository. If you just go to BMC at GitHub, I have pinned the repository so you'll see it first thing. You don't have to remember this horrible URL. Uh, and the readme in the repo explains how to use um, the notebooks. And they all should run in Databricks free, low powered Spark product called Community Edition. And there's a link in the readme that tells you how to create a Community Edition account. if. Um, if you're masochistic enough to want to try to do, run this stuff on your own. So with that, I'm going to jump out of the slides. And let me make this large enough so that people can actually read it. OK, is it actually readable? OK, good. Now, there are three, um, there are three notebooks in here and three notebooks in the repo. This one at the bottom, defs, is just kind of an include that defines things both notebooks use. If you were to want to run these yourselves, if you import the notebooks, uh, this one basically creates the data files for you. The data that we're using in here, for lack of anything better, is just some Twitter data. I have a Kafka server that, I, I, uh, that I'm running and a, um, a Scala server that reads live tweets and dumps them into the Kafka server. This notebook pulls some of them down and dumps them to a Parquet file. So we'll be reading that. They're fairly current tweets. I pulled them down uh, sometime yesterday when I was completing the talk. And then there's another uh, set of historical tweets from back in February that a colleague of mine grabbed through the uh, Twitter fire hose. And this thing also downloads those. I have those up in an S3 uh, bucket, and it downloads those in JSON format and dumps them into Parquet. So if you were to want to run these yourselves, you would just have to walk through this notebook, and then you would get a local version of the data for yourself. That's all I'm going to say about this one. Let's take a look at the, uh, this particular one. We'll start with the Data Frames API, because this is the one that most everybody uses when they're starting out. All right, it's probably the most common used, uh, commonly used Spark API these days. Um, it's used to query uh, data in Spark, to push data out to files, to do ETL, whatever it is that you're trying to do. You can do machine learning through the Data Frames API. So uh, it's, it's a query API. Basically, so we'll start. I've got this attached to a cluster in this notebook environment. Let me run my include. All right. Um, then we're going to pull in 
this uh, parquet file that contains the tweets that I pulled down yesterday. So you can see that creating a data frame is pretty straightforward. We can do relatively simple things like, you know, what's in, how many tweets are in there. So I pulled down about 38,000 tweets yesterday. Um, there's this display function. In normal Spark, you would do something like this. Outside of this notebook environment, you would say, I'd like to see the first, say, 20 rows of this data frame, which is really ugly in this environment. Um, so the Databricks environment actually has uh, this display function that does the same thing, but presents it in a little bit better output format. Okay, so you can see the kind of information that we're pulling down. All right, now what the Data Frame API is, is a DSL. It's, a, it's an internal domain-specific language. Um, it's a DSL in any of the languages supported by Spark. We're only concerned about Scala here. And it implements a query language. Um, it is not compile time type safe at all. Uh, so here's an example of a query. We're going to pull up some tweets from some people I never personally want to follow. Okay, this is about as far as I'm going to go in, in talking about politics in this talk. Okay, so uh, you can see that I'm, I'm using a primitive function called array contains, and the reason for that is that one of the fields here is, uh, is an array. So I'm basically just putting together a, a filter. You could use the word where here. It would work just as well. Okay, where the array contains any one of these things. Now, one of, the, one of the difficult problems here is that you'll notice I'm putting upper and lowercase variants of some of these hashtags. It's remarkably difficult to do a case-blind comparison with the built-in array contains. We're going to show, I'll show you in a few minutes a way around that using one of the other APIs. But you can see that what I'm doing here is I'm pulling out any row out of this data where the hashtag contains one, at least one of these particular hashtags or whether the, if the screen name, the person issuing the tweet, is um, my country's ridiculous president. All right, and then I'm selecting a subset of the columns, right? So this should look a little bit like SQL if you're familiar with it, and it's intended to, right? And then I can, having created a data frame, that's a secondary data frame that I get back. So I've started with the first data frame. The where clause produces a second intermediate data frame lazily. The select clause produces a third intermediate data frame, and I'm saving the third intermediate data frame. And what's happening here under the covers is that as I'm applying this DSL, the Spark is building up a query. So it's building a query AST under the covers. And when I run an action down here, like count, or like this display function, it's actually going to implement that query, optimize it, uh, build it up in terms of RDDs in the background, and then run it. Okay, and I don't recommend that you read these. It'll just make you angry. Okay, so the query language is, um, is pretty powerful, and it is quite reminiscent of SQL, as I mentioned, and that's also deliberate. Uh, and in fact, you can use SQL as well if you prefer. If you want even less type safety, you can just go straight to SQL, and, and that will work just as well. In fact, you can intermix the two. Um, so here's another example. What I'm gonna do here is count each individual uh, hashtag. What are the unique hashtags? So this explode function on this column basically essentially is a reverse pivot, right? It says this is an array in this column, so I'm going to break each element of the array out, one per row, and then duplicate all the other columns. So if you have a, if you have a row that has five hashtags, you'll get five rows after the explode, most of which is identical, but each row will have a different hashtag in it. So this is a way I can very easily pull out the hashtags. And then I'm going to group by the lowercase version of the hashtag because I don't care if mega and uppercase or lowercase are different. And then I just do a count and an order by. This looks almost exactly like SQL to me. Right? And if I display that, then I get a reverse list of the popular um, hashtags. And this Tempo Sehun thing, I had no idea what this was. I looked it up. I, I think it's a, a Singapore rap artist or something who's trending all over Twitter for some reason I don't understand. Okay, my 17-year-old daughter might understand. I should ask her. Okay, and I can always at any given point ask, what's the schema here? So what does, what does this look like? This lets, the, you know, what does the, the layout of the data actually look like? So I can ask this, what the schema is. Um, but as I said, data frames are not type safe. You might as well be doing Python here, and I'll show you why. So 
this will fail. The timestamp column, if we go look at the schema, is a timestamp. It corresponds to java.sql.timestamp in the JVM. And multiplying a timestamp by 1,000 doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense, right? So this will actually fail, but notice that the failure is a runtime error, not a compile time error. You get this lovely stack trace. This one, this is even worse, actually, because user is a string. It makes no sense to compare a string against the hard number 10, and yet, this works. I, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> and yet it works. It, it doesn't even fail. Right? And this is even worse. It just turns them all null. Okay? So not only isn't it compile time type safe, you don't always even get a runtime error. All right, so, so for those of us who really like type safety, this is kind of horrifying. So what do we do about that? Oh, and by the way, um, I'm going to pull up a non-existent column here. And again, that's going to result not in a compile time error, but a runtime error. OK, so once again, I might as well just be using Python, because I'm not getting any help from the compiler here. And then, even if you get everything right, OK, at some point, you're going to want to take the data that you've distributed out to all the executors, right, all the nodes, and you're going to want to pull some of that back to the driver, to your application, and maybe look at it, or play with it, or, or do something with it. And once you do that, when I do a collect here, what I'm going to do is pull back some of the, the rows. I'm, supposedly, I'm getting this back as an array, right, an array of each row. And what I get back is a Spark row type. I'm going to drill into the first row, data sub zero, and then pull out the first column. Okay, so notice the double, uh, the double index there. Okay, so there, that's what you would expect. This happens to be the, um, the, the user's screen name, but note the type. And note the type here. To make that a little bit more apparent, let's go down here. and assign it to a variable. Isn't that wonderful? So we know full well this is a string, but the compiler does not. Right? So if I want to do anything with it back here, then I have to cast it. Right? So I can either use the standard as instance of, or I can pull the things back with JDBC style get calls. But of course, I have to know what the type is to make that call ahead of time. I get no help. Right? So I can do this. And I can get the data back that way and store it into this case class. But I have to know what the type is just as if I were calling into JDBC. And if I get it wrong, I'm going to get a runtime error, if I'm lucky. So this is also kind of inconvenient. All right, and as, as expected, you will get a runtime error with a bad cast. So there's another thing that you can do. You can say, all right, so there's no notice up here, sorry. Notice up here that I'm not saying get as timestamp. That's because it doesn't have a get timestamp. So I'm doing a get as with, a, with an explicit type in here. And if I get that wrong, which I'm doing down here, this is incorrect. It really is a timestamp and not a date. Once again, I get a runtime error, a class cast exception. Back to Python. So here's one way we can get around that is you can flip to this thing called the data set API. Now, this is available only in Scala. Python programmers don't care about stuff like this. Uh, and what this allows us to do is actually take a data frame and cast it to something that operates on a type that is more refined than row. So let's, um, I've, I've taken the liberty of creating the case classes that we need. So there's the tweet data uh, right down here. OK, most of these things are uh, single elements, primitives, most of them, except for this one, because it's a nested schema. So remember, if we go back up here, we can see that Hang on. It's mostly flat, except for this thing called place. So this is actually nested, and these two arrays. So I'm accounting for that in this type down here. OK, so let me, let me instantiate these guys, or define them. And now all I have to do it, to create a data set is to cast the data frame. All right, now this, um, it's a cast. And as with all casts, it's kind of ugly. Um, so first, let's see why this is, I mean, how does this actually work? So what happens is that Spark SQL kind of does reflection on your case classes. And it matches up the elements of the case classes with the columns in your schema 
by name. So if you get the names wrong or the types wrong, you might have a problem. So as an illustration of that, here's one where I've gotten the names wrong in the place. I put underscores in, in place of camel case so they don't match anymore. Um, and I, I believe I've gotten at least one wrong in here. Yes, hashtags. Okay, so if I try to do this here, okay, quick, uh, let me hide that. I'm gonna try to do a cast to these. Am I gonna get a compile time error or a runtime error? Anyone wanna guess? Yes, lovely, right? So that's exactly what's gonna happen. I get a runtime error and it's a, a, once again, a very wonderful, very long, hard to read stack trace. However, once we've actually done the cast, now we can start to, we can start to use the thing in a more type safe fashion. The nice thing about this API is if you don't use lambdas, if you don't fall into the functional programming style, you can still use this the same way you would use a data frame with the query level calls and nothing changes. Okay, so you'll notice I'm doing SQL style stuff here. There's no difference now between this and the data frame it came from, from that perspective. And in fact, if you were actually to look in the API, you would notice that a data frame is nothing more than a type def for a data set of type row. So it's a degenerate data set. So they all behave the same, but I can also do this. Okay, so now I can actually look for, um, I wanna find all rows that have, uh, that have hashtags. So I want to discard the ones that don't have hashtags. And let's take the first one, which will return take in Spark returns, let's just like take in the collections API, right? I'm going to get back an array in this case, an array of you know, one row. And then I'll just take the first one and we'll take a look at the hashtags. OK, so there's one. And I could just as easily say, let's take 10 of them. And then because it's ridiculous to look at them any other way, let's do that. I'm sorry, I don't want head. Let's do a take 10 and get rid of the head. And that's not readable, is it? So let's do this. Let's just do this. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but you'll get the idea. Okay, so guaranteed each row here has hashtags. That works very nicely, it's very easy to read, right? And I can now test for this ridiculous and annoying hashtag with one line. I don't have to test for all case variants separately. I can just do, you know, use a nice functional exists on it and it works perfectly. And it will, if we would go through this whole thing, we would find any lowercase ones. In fact, look, there's one right there. So that works perfectly. So great, we have our types back, right? And now the compiler can protect us. Now if I try to compare a timestamp with 100, I get a compiler error, which is what I want. That's just, this is great, right? If I try to multiply it, I get a compiler error, which is what I want. So this is nice, so now I have my types back, right? Everybody was thrilled to death when they came out with the datasets API. And even better, when I pulled stuff back to the driver, I no longer have this weird casting I need to do. When I collect this stuff, I get back an array of my tweet data case class. So now I have something I can operate on without having to do any casting on it. I did that one cast up top to cast the data frame into a data set. And that could fail at runtime. But once I get past that hurdle, now I can do type safe stuff, right? So then the next question is, well, why not just stick with this then? I've, I've solved the problem, right? Have I solved the problem? Who thinks I've solved the problem? Yeah, nobody's raising their hand because otherwise we wouldn't be talking about frameless, right? <laughs> okay. So this doesn't solve the problem. And here's why it doesn't solve the problem. So the first problem is that, the, who here has heard of tungsten? I know you have, but um, okay. So I'm not, we don't have a mic on you, so I won't ask you to explain what it is, right? But when you're working with, um, with data frames and data sets, um, the data is stored internally in this tungsten format. So the best way to describe it that I found is to compare and contrast it with what used to happen in the RDD world, right? The RDD API looks like the Scala Collections API, which means you program it with lambdas. Now, what does a lambda need to receive in order to operate on it? An object, right? It has to receive a JVM object. 
So in the RDD API, when a partition, and this is how things work in Spark, right? What it does is it divides up your data into these partitions, pieces, right? And then each partition is processed in parallel. Um, it's processed in across individual executors, which are distinct separate JVM processes, typically running on different nodes. And then each executor has a thread pool within it. Um, so you've got parallelism across nodes and then parallelism within each node. And each of those threads across all the nodes can process one partition at a time, right? So that's essentially, at a high level, that's the parallelization mechanism. So the data is broken up into these partitions. The driver then just says to each executor, okay, you're gonna get this set of partitions. Uh, you're gonna operate on this set of partitions. You're gonna operate on that set of partitions. And then they all operate on them independently. And each, each time a thread becomes available, if there's another partition that that executor needs to process, it gives it to that thread to operate on. So that's the mechanism for parallelizing. At the RDD API, when, the, when it was time to process a partition, it gets read out of the file into an array object and might just be an array of strings, but it's objects all the way down, right? And you need objects so that you can pass them into your lambdas, but that has overhead, right? So you've got object overhead, that's memory use, and you've got garbage collection overhead. So the RDD API can be quite inefficient because of all that overhead. So what tungsten is, is instead sort of think of it as a big byte buffer in memory that's not subject to garbage collection, and it's column oriented and it's compact. Right, so if you've got a column of integers, all those integers will be packed next to one another in memory, which means it's very easy then to prune columns. It also means that, for instance, if you have a column of integers and you're operating on all the integers in that column at once, well now because they're next to one another in memory, certain CPU optimizations can take place, like prefetch, right? So there's all kinds of, uh, of advantages to this tungsten um, uh, storage mechanism, and this is what data frames uses by default. Right, so the data for a partition then is read into this flat um, in-memory buffer that's not subject to garbage collection. And when your query that you've put together through, through these query primitives in data frames, when your query gets executed, it's implemented in terms of RDDs that can operate directly out of tungsten. It does not need to manifest JVM objects to do its work. So it's quite efficient. But what do you suppose happens then if we start using data sets and we're doing stuff like this. We now have a problem, right? Because this filter function is expecting to get a JVM object, but that's not where the data is stored. Right? The data is actually stored in a buffer. And so now what happens is that Spark needs to manifest an object. So what it does is it's, and this is really high level, and I'm gonna have to make this a, now that just about fits. So what you've got here is, um, up until the point where it hits the red filter there, where we're doing the lambda, it can operate directly out of tungsten. But as soon as it hits that filter that expects to find a tweet, it has to take that row of data and convert it into instances of our case class, right? Or an instance of our case class. Um, it does so with code that it generates on the fly. So it actually has, uh, the way Michael Armbrist, one of the, the Spark developers described it is, he said, imagine giving a first year computer science student the job to write a serializer and a deserializer for a particular data structure. What will this first year science student do? They'll write code that is very specific to that data structure, right? You won't be able to use it with any, it's not generalizable, you won't be able to use it with anything else. So that's kind of bad, but what's good about it is it can be very specific to that data structure. It can be tuned to serialize and deserialize that data structure quite efficiently. And they used that insight, and inside Spark, they implemented that first year computer science student effectively, right? So what it, essentially what they do is they take a look and they say, this tweet coming in here is of this case class type with these nested types. We're gonna generate Java code on, on the fly that can pull that out of tungsten and store it efficiently into you know, an instance of this case class. And then they compile it on the fly with Janino, I believe, under the covers. And then at the other end of the pipe where we have to leave our little pipeline lambdas, and up there it's the map, right? So now we've converted this to string, but then we're gonna go back to a data frame and start doing data framey stuff, and so we gotta put the data back into tungsten. So there's another piece of code generation that has to occur, something that can map the string in this case, but whatever it is that's coming out of the tail end of our lambda pipeline back into tungsten. So that's overhead. 
right? You're paying an overhead penalty whenever you use lambdas in the data set API. Maybe you don't care. Maybe it's an ETL job that runs at three in the morning and it's always done by the time you get in and that's fine, but you have to know that there's some overhead here. So that's problem number one with the data sets API. Problem number two is the issue of optimizations. And this is best um, shown by illustration. So let's take a look at just a, the um, uh, data frame API here. So here we're doing a select. Now what I've done here is I've created another um, Parquet file of just a bunch of users in that old Twitter data from February. Um, and it, it, there's no reason to do this other than it gives me something to do a join against. Okay, so, so ostensibly the use case, which is kind of stupid, is let me see which of these idiots tweeting about my president was still was doing that back in February. Okay, so not that I ever really want to do this in production, but it's, it's an, a good illustration, right? So here what I'm doing is I'm selecting um, out of these, the, the list of old ones from February, I'm selecting the screen name. I'm doing a union um, with, uh, with all of the user screen names in the current one. Right, and I'm gonna dump it to a file. So this is just a bit of quick ETL so that I have something against which to join. And as soon as that's done, we're gonna do a little bit of magic here. Um, there is something in Spark known as a broadcast join. If one side of a join is small enough, what Spark actually does is suck it into memory and give a copy of that thing to every executor as an efficiency mechanism. I am turning that off here because it actually confuses, it's harder to explain, the, to show you the explain plan there. So I'm essentially gonna set that threshold really, really low to avoid a broadcast join just because it's gonna illustrate what I'm trying to say a little bit easier. So that's what this is. So ignore the magic behind the curtain here. And what we're going to do is we're gonna read in, we're gonna create a data frame with that list of users. And we're gonna join that with this one right, to try to find out who was tweeting back then. And then we're gonna do a filter. Now look at this, what's wrong with this? There's actually something wrong with the way I put this together, right? I'm doing the filter after the join, but I'm filtering on one half of the join. From an efficiency standpoint, wouldn't you wanna do the filter first? So you're not joining as much data? Okay, but the nice thing about this is that it doesn't matter, okay, because if you look down here, and this is just a, a call that I can make on a, uh, on a data frame to say, hey, what's the query plan look like so far? Right, so here's the query plan, and these numbers are showing what order in which it's doing things. And notice that the, the, there's a filter here. Now this is the original array contains thing from the, the morons um, data frame. Right, but notice that here's the, here's the filter on that, that I put up here, and that's occurring in step three and the, I'm not sure why this isn't scrolling properly, and the, the, um, the join is occurring in step five. So if you read this, what does this mean? It means that the optimizer, which could, in Spark is called Catalyst, looked at this and said, basically, it's safe for me to move that filter before the join, and in fact, it's more efficient, right? It's analyzed and optimized my query, and it said, you're doing a filter on one half of this thing you're joining with. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna move this ahead, and so it did that for me. Um, so it doesn't matter that I got them in the wrong order. Now, how is it able to do that? Because this is a query API. I'm giving it all the information. I'm telling it what columns I'm operating on. I'm even telling it what operations I'm doing. Is it an equals operation? Is it a, you know, is it something it can use a hash on, right? I've given it all the information it needs to, to figure out how it can move things around. And there are all kinds of other optimizations it can do. If it knows what columns you're filtering on, for instance, and it knows both sides of it, it can do what's known as predicate pushdown, right? Predicate pushdown, the best, the best and easiest to understand way I've ever come across to describe it is imagine that one half of my join um, is actually, or not even a join, imagine I'm reading from a JDBC database or from Cassandra and I do column pruning. So I do a select and I only fill out, I only pull three of the columns out of the 350 that are in this row, this table. It can put that, push that filtering down into the database. It doesn't have to manifest that data in memory only to throw most of it away like it would with the CSV file. If it's an RDBMS, if I'm doing a filter operation where I say, hey, only give me the rows that have this particular username, 
if it knows it's talking to a database, it can push that filter operation down into an appropriate where clause, right? It knows how to do that because you've given it all the information about what you're trying to do. However, that is not the case here, right? Here we have a problem. Here we have a filter operation that, that does a case match inside of it. This is a lambda. By the time Spark sees this, it's opaque bytecode. It doesn't know what you're doing in there. It doesn't know what columns you're operating on because you're passing, you're receiving a row. It doesn't, it doesn't know how to move this around. It can't make any decisions about what you're doing in that filter. So it has to do it in the order you give it in. So I'm effectively doing a very similar thing here, but it's going to be far more inefficient. And now we see that here's my join. Right? And the join occurs, and the filter, the filter is done after the join. And that's why, because it can't look inside the filter and say, oh, you're only filtering on one half, you know, one side of this, and therefore I can move this filter ahead of time. It doesn't know, because it's looking at bytecode. Right? So this is, a, this is another reason why the dataset API might, in fact, not be a good choice for you, depending on what you're doing. You get types back, but you pay a penalty for it. You pay a penalty in potential lost optimization, and you pay a, p a potential penalty in this conversion between tungsten and, uh, and the, the object format and back again. Okay, which is not to say the API is not useful. It is useful. But you have to be aware that, that you're, you're paying these penalties. So this leads me with 20 some minutes left to what a lot of people think is the solution to the problem. And this is just going to be a brief kind of overview of this. There's lots more in the documentation for Frameless. But Frameless um, uses the usual shapeless style type programming trickery to add um, compile time type safety, okay, which means you may have some really weird compiler errors to dig through. But it also means that you get this type safety without paying a penalty because there's no runtime component to the type safety. It's all done in the compiler. Okay, so, um, so in Frameless, in order to do this, you use a typed data set. And we can create one directly out of data, or we can also just create one out of the data set we already have above, which is what I'm going to do. All right, so let me pull in a bazillion imports here that we need. And then all I'm going to do is say, I'd, I'd like a typed data set out of this other data set that we had. Ah, this failed. Okay, so why did this fail? So how does it know how to create this type of data set out of my um, data set? Well, it's using type inference, right? It's trying, and it's figuring out based on a whole bunch of implicits that I hauled up in, in above, how to convert, how to encode my data. Basically how to translate between my case class and what needs to be actually passed into Spark. And the problem here is that it provides a bunch of those encoders for primitives, but there are some it doesn't provide, right? So Frameless uses typed encoders, as it says here, to convert to and from the underlying type. And if we go back, and I apologize, I don't have a way to get back here, but we'll go down here. If we take a look at this guy, how do you figure out now what it's complaining about? Because all it said was, I can't convert this tweet data thing. So again, you have to use a little bit of intuition, and you look through here and you realize pretty much everything in here is a primitive or a variant of a primitive, a string, a long, right? But the one thing that isn't is this guy, Java SQL timestamp. So at a guess, I'm going to say it's the Java SQL timestamp that it doesn't know how to encode and decode. And so the solution to that is to provide an encoder and a decoder for that. And it's pretty straightforward to do. It's basically just creating this thing called an injection. You give it an apply method that says, you know, given a timestamp, tell me how you want to encode it as, as a long in this case. Um, and then given a long, how do I get back to a timestamp? So this is pretty straightforward. And there's actually a shorter version of it as well, if you prefer, that's just lambdas. This, this is the version for those of us who really enjoy underscores. Okay? And then once I've done that, this works. And the documentation on how to create these things is pretty good. You know, if you, if you run into this problem, you just have to start creating typed encoders for the obvious things in your case class until, you, until it works. So it takes a little bit of work sometimes to figure it out. But after a while, you develop an intuition that, oh, it's, it's probably these non-primitive things in here. 
So having done that, I now have my type data set. Now, um, the typical way to, to get access to stuff here is to use symbols. So I'm going to subscript here. I'm going to say I want to select just the username column, and you use the symbol here. All right, now what this, this is lazy, like the select operation in the data set API and the data frame API, this does not actually do anything other than produce a new typed data set. It's a lazy operation. Okay, and now we can call an action. Um, if you don't know Spark, what actions are are the things that actually trigger your, your query to run. So typical actions are collect. I'd like to pull the contents of this data frame or data set back to the driver. Take, I'd like to pull some of it back, not all of it. I don't want to have an OOM. Um, you know, write. I want to write this stuff out to a file. Show is a good one. I'd like to pull some of the data back and print it out on the console. Okay, so we're going to call show here. And really, I can, I, I can just do this. Rather than limit 10, I can just do a show 10. Now, in regular Spark, um, these, um, these actions are active, right? They're not lazy. But nothing happened here. I didn't get my data back. And that's because this is a typical functional API, right? A typical type level functional API. And even these actions are lazy, right? And there's a, and we'll talk more about them um, a little bit later. But what they return is this thing called a frameless job. And toward the end of this talk, I'll show you what you can do with frameless jobs. So really, in order to, and if you've used any of, if you've used CATS, if you've used CATS Effect, if you've used any of these APIs, this won't surprise you at all, right? It doesn't say um, unsafe run sync or anything, but run is the rough equivalent, right? So we're going to run the job, and now we get what we want. Although we have an ugly column name, so we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. But now we're getting exactly what we want, right? Now remember what happens with a data frame or a data set um, if I select a bad column. Okay, and by the way, the data frame and data set API also supports uh, uh, using symbols to specify the column names. So I'm using, I'm doing that here for consistency with, um, with the type data set. I could also have done um, the usual way of doing it, which is this, right? Or the canonical form, which is the subscript form, right? Which actually looks even more like what we're doing here. But let's go back to the let's go back to the one I had, All right? So I'm going to get what a runtime error here, right? Not a compile time error. And there it is with that wonderful stack trace that we love so well. But that's not true with this one. Here we have compile time type safety. Okay, it's it, you might find the compiler error to be a little weirdly worded. But with a little practice, it's easy enough to read. Right, so that's nice. I like this. Right now, now my my Spark job fails to compile if I type something incorrectly. I don't find out after I've allocated the cluster and I'm paying for a couple of EC2 nodes to run everything. Right. Um, you it does have arbitrary column operations. So here's an example of an arbitrary column operation in the data frame API. Right. What I'm doing is I'm selecting the ID. I'm multiplying it by two because of course we always do that with database IDs. Right. Uh, and then I'm going to cast the column to uh, ID doubled. Um, and then I'm going to also select out, or not cast it, I'm sorry, rename it to give it a, a meaningful name. And then I'm going to select as well the user screen name. And let's show the first 10 rows of that. OK, and that works as expected. So this is um, a derived on the fly column, right? Well, you can do the same thing here. And it works pretty much the same way, except that you get these weird column names. And the reason you get these weird column names is because what's coming out of the select is just a tuple. So if, if you get rid of this and you run it, you'll see that the type is just this, right? It's just a tuple of long and option string. And of course, there's no field name associated with either of those values, so there's no column name, right? Now, we can fix that, as it turns out. There are a couple of interesting ways that you can fix that. I think I can get this talk done in time. I love it when this happens and I don't, I don't time the talk ahead of time and I still get close to the right time. OK, so um, one of the things that you can use here is, um, is you can either use a frameless projection, 
or what's known as casting. So here's a casting version. Now the way the casting works is that I can essentially take a case class, which you know now I'm giving names to the columns, right? So here I've taken my tuple effectively, and I've said, okay, instead of pulling this into a tuple, let's um, uh, let's map the tuple into an instance of this case class where the first field is a long and the second field is um, in, you know is the option string that I want. Um, if you use this approach, then it, they have to line up. So it, 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 you know, it's almost like an unapply, right? It has to line up so that the, you're coming out, what's coming out of here is a tuple of long and option string. So the case class's order of fields are gonna have to be long and option string, right? So it has to line up uh, in, that, in that fashion. But if you do that with that cast, then you get your, your column names back. So it's a pretty straightforward way of doing this. And as you might expect, if you get it backwards, um, you'll get an error. And I'll show you that in a minute. Now, here's a projection. Projection is typically used to, um, I've got you know, this case class that represents my schema. And I would like to use a subset of this. right? I, I want to pare my data set down. This is the equivalent of selecting just five columns right, out of the 15 columns that you have. In that particular case, if you use a projection, they don't have to line up. It doesn't have to be long string, whatever. You can basically think of it as you're projecting a bigger case class onto a smaller case class. And what it will do is, at compile time, it'll line it up based on the field names and types. Okay, so they don't have to be in order in the case of a projection. Right, so here's an example of a projection. Okay, in this one, note the names don't need to match. It's matching up, um, it's matching up based on, on the types. I'm sorry, the names do need to match up, right? The names have to match up. Sorry, I misspoke. In both cases, if we screw it up, we'll get a compile time error. So here's a case where I'm going to select this in the opposite order. Okay, so now what I'm doing out of the select is producing a tuple of option string long instead of the other way around. And if I try to cast that into my ID doubled and name, I'm going to get a compile time error because the field order is not consistent with the field order in the case class. But at least it's a compile time error, even if it's a little hard to read. And the same with the projection. Here, the names don't match. OK, so I put username instead of user screen name. And I also get it, uh, compiler error. Right, and at least this compiler error is, you know, has a nice little, perhaps not all the member names and types are the same. So at least it's giving me a, a pretty decent hint. And then finally, here's a projection where the names match, but one of the types is wrong. I have a string rather than an option string, right? And once again, I'm going to get this, the, pretty much the same error I got before, right? I can't prove that I can map this into that, right? So you got to fix something. Um, and, and again, compare that to here, where I'm doing the cast from the data frame to the data set. Okay, so this is the cast we did earlier, where I'm trying to make my data frame into a data set. So I'm selecting the username the user screen name and the ID, and I'm going to cast it into this here. But it's bad again because the username in the case class doesn't match the column name, which is user screen name. Spark is also using names here to line these things up. And the obvious question is, will I get a compile time error or a runtime error? Who thinks compile time error? Good, you're paying attention. <laughs> yeah, you get a runtime error. So you screwed up and you're not going to find out until you've wasted, you know, 50 bucks on those ET2 nodes, if you're lucky. Okay, and then there are a whole bunch of um, functions that are available. Um, it, what the Frameless documentation says is that most of the built-in Spark functions are also replicated in Frameless. But if there's something that you need to do in, in Frameless that isn't in there yet, there's a dot data set that you can call on type data set that will drop you right down to the Spark data set API. So you can go back down to the less type-friendly version, but you can still get your job done. All right, so I can do things like uh, drop tupled, which is how you drop a single column. And what this thing is going to return is another type data set. Now notice, once again, we're getting back something that's tupled, right? We've changed the schema from the case class. By dropping the ID, we have to get back a different kind of type. And, and because we haven't done an as or a project here, we're getting back a type that's really a tuple. Right? And so to, to run that, you'll end up seeing the same sort of weird column names. Right? That's pretty ugly. That looks better when I don't zoom the screen in. 
Um, you can use with column replaced to do replacement of a column on the fly. Okay, I'd like to replace the ID column with the ID uh, modulo 10,000 because I want as many database collisions as I can get. Um, all right, and let me, let me actually change this slightly. Uh, now we'll do this. You can see it here. It looks better if I don't zoom it in, but you can see that um, somewhere in here, you can see the IDs have all been uh, mod 10,000. Right? And you can even use the built-in lit function, which models the lit function in Spark to give you a literal. I'd like to replace all the IDs with a literal zero, please. All right? And there it is. There's your literal zero in all the ID fields. All right? So pretty straightforward to use. What about adding columns? Well, here's one way to do it. Again, um, I can do a... Now this is just a project. Okay, so I'm projecting... This is what I talked about earlier. I don't want to deal with all that data. For this example, I only care about the hashtags, the text, and the screen name. So what I've done is I've defined a, a case class here that has um, a subset of the fields that I want, and I'm projecting down to that, right? So this will give us a little bit less to little fewer columns to work with. All right, that actually fits on the screen, which is nice. And then here I'm going to say, I'd like to add a column here. And what I'm doing here is I'm saying I'm going to add a column um, so effectively, shapeless or uh, frameless, figure out the difference between the sum data and the sum data two, which in this case is the introduction of this ID column, right? And fill that in with a zero, right? And oh, by the way, make the type sum data two. Okay, and having done that now, TDS sum two is of frameless type data set sum data two, and here you can see the ID in there. Oh good, we're almost at the bottom. I won't run out of time. All right, and I can even conditionally replace a column value with this when thing. Okay, so I can say basically with column tupled, okay, which is basically going to add a column and return a, a, a new tupled schema, I would like to say, well look, if the screen name is set to this thing, then set then use the ID. Otherwise set the ID to zero or to one. Okay, so if the screen name doesn't match this, so what will happen is this particular row will have its ID set to one, and all the rest will be left at what they currently are, which is zero. Right? And if we, if we run that and take a look at it, we can see that that's in fact exactly what happened, even though I lost all my column names because this is a tuple type. Right? But here's the guy whose ID was set to one. Um, and I could project or cast to get back a, a reasonable type. Now, the weird thing about this is that because of the way the compiler does inference, you can't reverse this. Okay, so if you try to reverse that, try to do the equals here and put the lit on the first line and then do the otherwise here, you'll get a compiler error. It can't figure things out. In, in this particular order, it, it can't figure out that, um, essentially it sees this before it sees this and it can't do the proper inference. So you do have to be a little bit careful here. This is one of the little weird edge cases that you have to be careful of. You might have to reverse the test of some of these things in order to get the compiler to work because the type inference isn't doing what you think it ought to do. But there's generally a way around that. At least I haven't found it to be too difficult to manage. OK, now typically, um, one of the things you might want to do here is I want to select all the columns, but I also want to add an ID doubled column. OK, so this is how you would do it with a data frame. And then the frameless way would be to say, um, select the entire typed data set as a column, and then add another column. Now, the output is a little bit different. So if I run this, you can see that what happens is I get this ID doubled column at the end of my data frame. So it's flat, right? Just a new column tacked on the end. But with frameless, what I get is something a little different. The entire row gets collapsed into this column, and then the new column gets added. Okay, which seems a little bit odd. I've created a new nested data type which leads to our next thing, nested schemas, right? So let's actually take that thing and write it out, right? I'm gonna make a JSON nested uh, file out of that just so that I can play with it a little bit. Um, this will be the final bit. Um, take a quick look at how, I'm gonna read this into a data frame. Okay, and if I wanna get access to, notice here's the tweet, right? So here's the row ID, I called it row ID. Here's the tweet. This is a nested structure. So if I want to drill into this, 
in the standard data frame API, I use dot notation. I want to pull out just the screen name. Right, now if I get it wrong, once again, I get a runtime error, right? If I want to do it in frameless, instead, first I'm going to create my, my nested uh, typed data set, and then I'm going to use this call many function. And it basically just feed it a, a variadic argument list of the columns and that you want to drill into, and then pull it back that way. Right, so maybe a little less readable than dot notation, but once again, what you get out of it is a compile time error if you get it wrong, which is the whole reason we're using this API, right? So finally, since I'm running up against the end of it, let's take a look at the last little bit. I promised you we get back to looking at jobs really briefly. Um, and just a, a few examples here of why jobs, one of the values of the job being lazy, right, is that they're composable. So here's a job. This is an action, right? So this will return a job. And then I can take that job and flat map over it and take that count and then do another action. Okay, I want to take um, a sampling of this. It's not a particularly useful sampling. It's, it's basically taking um, one one hundredth of the data set right off the top. So it's hardly a statistically valid sample, but it is a sample, right? And I've chained these two jobs together. And we're not going to look at all 100 of these, but it works fine. And in fact, that's ugly. But because we're using flat map, then we can just do this, right? This is just a for comprehension. But instead of chaining together transformations, which you certainly can do in the RDD or the Datasets API, I'm chaining together jobs of actions, right? Which allows you to compose things at a different level. Right? So this is essentially the same thing. Um, and then this is another example of that, right? I've got this function here that says, um, take the sample tweets and um, give me only those that have hashtags, right? So out of that sample that you've given me, which is a job of type sequence tweet data, go find the ones that have hashtags. So I'm doing a map over that sampling, and I'm saying filter out only the ones that have hashtags, right? Now, again, we're not worried these are jobs, but, the, but because they're actions, all these actions are actually going to occur in the driver, right? So we're not so worried about the fact that we're, we're screwing up the, the query analyzer because they're actions. And so you're, they're going to be operating on data back in the driver. This just gives you a way to compose these, these things as primitives, right? And so, so you'll see I'm going to run this. I'm going to pull this back with the chain jobs. And then I'm going to say, let's actually take the sample and do the filter manually and verify that I get the same number back as I do with the chain jobs. I'm not going to check the actual contents. I'll assume they're correct. But you can see that I'm getting the same number of values back, and I'm going to presume they're the same ones. All right? And so that's essentially right up against the end of it. I went three minutes over, but I started two or three minutes late, so I don't feel bad. So, um, so I've touched a little bit of each of these APIs, right? So if you don't know Spark at all, now you have a kind of a, a general sense of what each of these APIs can do. Um, and maybe if you do know Spark, you have a general sense of what you can do with Frameless, and I would encourage you to play a little bit more with Frameless. I'm having great fun playing with it. So the final question that I'm, I'm going to ask myself is, which one should I use? Right? Which one should I use? Should I immediately jump into Frameless for everything? And my answer is, I generally use data frames if I'm exploring data. A customer has sent a piece of data, or I'm building a piece of curriculum or a talk, and there's a brand new data file out there that I've never looked at before, and I've got to experiment with this thing, right? I've got to run some transforms on it. I've got to pull some of the stuff back. Maybe I have to run a little bit of machine learning on it. I'm still trying to figure out the shape of this data. I generally use data frames there. I mean, yes, runtime error, but there's less to type, right? And I don't care about the runtime error problem when I'm experimenting with the data. But once I'm starting to build my production pipelines um, and maybe building them outside this notebook environment um, where I can run tests on them and I want to be able to run compiles and I want to be able to hook them up to Travis or Jenkins or something that's going to automatically check it when I check it into Git, now I'm going to switch over to frameworks. Now I want the compile time protection. This is real, right? This isn't just me playing around with the script trying to figure out the data. This is real. I don't want to be paying to find out that I screwed this up when I fired up a 15-node cluster on Amazon or, or Azure, right? So that's my recommendation. Stick with data frames when you're fooling around because you're going to find that it's a little bit easier just to figure things out on the fly. 
but then cut over to, uh, to Frameless when it's time to do the production stuff. Now, you're certainly willing or welcome to use Frameless all the time. I'm just saying that's what I do. So that's it. Um, that's the end of it. I would recommend, uh, feel free to pull this stuff down from my Git repo and play with it on your own in uh, Databricks Community Edition. And check out typelevel.org slash frameless where there's way more information there than I was able to go over in this short talk. So thanks very much. <laughs>